another type of enviro environmental exposure that some of us may be exposed to living where we do in these uh, times are gunshot wounds. Uh, you may have seen these. Uh, you may have seen them in cadavers. You may have seen them on TV or CSI. But basically, the th uh, thing to take home is that uh, an entrance wound is always a lot cleaner than an exit wound. And another thing to remember is that a close range gunshot wound like you see here on the right is more likely to show powder stippling you know both grossly and microscopically whereas a fire range uh, entrance wound uh, also having a clean margin but will not show much by way of powder burning and close range usually means uh, you know several inches to about a foot or so uh, after about that you see very very little of this uh, powder burning let's talk about burns sometimes the uh, term full versus partial burns is used to describe whether it's basically just the epidermis or deep within the dermis that's involved sometimes the uh, terms first second third fourth are used and of course the third and fourth degree burns generally correlate to the full thickness whereas a partial thickness would be more likely first or second I don't think it's a hard fast rule that's very difficult to determine as well um, the percentage of the body is probably even more important than the degree of the burn and overall survival if you look at the charts you'll often see a rule of nines because if you look at these various regions of the body they can also always be divided in terms of nine 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 there's about eleven of them so when you add them up comes up to a hundred percent I believe a, uh, a leg is twice as much as an arm and a torso is uh, about twice as much as a leg so when you add those all up they come up to about a hundred and uh, of course uh, infants uh, slightly different ratios the survival of burns also depends on uh, the degree of uh, uh, respiratory tract involvement uh, inhalation tracheal burning as well as the age of the patient 50 is usually the cutoff point uh, kids have remarkably uh, much greater tolerance for burn survival than adults and especially adults over 50. Another big thing is speed of access to the burn unit. It also determines survival and as you know lack of survival in the early stages of a significant burn is usually related to shock and uh, pulmonary cardiovascular whereas in the later stages after a couple of days the uh, chief uh, lack of survival from a burn is because of infection and pseudomonas staph aureus candida are always like the big uh, organisms to produce perhaps a septic shock if they can survive the first uh, few days of cardiovascular and fluid loss and so forth um, there's actually a bunch of formula formulas you could uh, look up uh, I think Harvard has a really good one and it'll basically tell you if uh, somebody with a certain uh, thickness of burn involving what percentage of the body with or without respiratory tract blah 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 whether they're going to survive or not I know that well because I had a very good friend die of a burn hyperthermia uh, is also can be looked at as a spectrum a as well in the earliest stages of it you may have some muscle cramping because of electrolyte loss, uh, loss uh, chiefly sweat this is uh, entirely reversible and may have happened to all of us at one time or another in the more serious stages but still not really considered uh, w much of a mortality still totally reversible is heat exhaustion and not only has there been some uh, significant water depletion like here with cramps but there's also some uh, cardiovascular uh, decompensation as well this is still entirely reversible the uh, end of the spectrum which is usually not reversible has a very high mortality I would say at least 50 percent is the uh, term heat stroke and here not only have you had a lot of cardiovascular decompensation and sweat loss but you have uh, extensive uh, peripheral dilatation and that's pretty much the definition of what we call shock isn't it uh, temperatures of over 105 106 have been reported frequently sometimes over 110 and uh, people uh, 
don't usually survive from heat stroke, whereas they all survive from heat cramps and heat exhaustion. Let's talk about hypothermia, often seen in the setting of uh, uh, alcoholism, homelessness. That basically, those are the two big uh, settings for hypothermia. You may see them in the emergency room. Uh, a general rule is you can get temperatures uh, into the mid-90s and they can very easily recover, but it's very hard to see somebody with a central temperature of less than 90 degrees that has recovered. So if you want to remember 90 degrees as being a cutoff point for lack of survival, you can. The terminal events uh, preceding uh, uh, death with uh, significant hypothermia are bradycardia and uh, reasons I don't understand, atrial fibrillation. Those are the two things to look out for. Let's talk about lightning uh, exposures, uh, something that uh, you're likely to see uh, at a golfer, or especially at golfers in Florida. Uh, basically, the tissue damage is um, the electrical disturbances of lightning can affect significantly neural and EKG transmissions, but there's also a very, very significant thermal injury as well. And uh, oh, I, I think I duplicated this, but a tissue's uh, resistance to electrical flow is directly proportional to heat. So if something is uh, a t totally non-conductor, a poor conductor like fat, they would expect to have generate high amounts of eat heat in an ele electrical strike. Whereas something like nerve, you know, salt water, perhaps muscle, those would be less likely to show significant, you know, heat uh, pathology changes. Sometimes, but not usually, you'll get these spectacular lightning marks, which are arborizing skin patterns, uh, which I've only seen a couple of times. But basically, that's pretty much the signature of a lightning strike as a lightning pattern along the skin. Uh, let's talk about pressure exposures. Uh, there's three different kinds when you think about it. One of them is just from being too high up and the lack of oxygen and lack of uh, pressure. Uh, these are the things that mountain climbers get. There are blast injuries or sudden drastic uh, changes in air pressure resulting in significant uh, respiratory uh, and uh, gastrointestinal disruptions uh, uh, often fatal. And then there are the slow decompression injuries that the uh, scuba divers get exposed to and they have all their special terms for. Let's look at the first uh, situation of high altitude illness. Uh, the uh, base camp at Mount Everest is called uh, pulmonary edema and basically the significant danger in high altitude climbing uh, is uh, HAPE or high altitude pulmonary edema in which uh, altitudes usually over about 4,000 meters uh, can result in significant confusion, obtundation and with increased capillary permeability secondary to that is the setting for acute pulmonary People that don't make it to Everest and they don't fall, they usually die of pulmonary edema if, as, as long as uh, or freezing to death. Uh, let's talk about um, blast injuries, sudden increases, uh, rapid atmospheric pressure increases. Well, because the lungs are filled with air that are pretty close to the air pressure, uh, a very significant change in this basically would result in a significant uh, uh, ripping up of the alveolar septa hemorrhage in the lungs. And because we have atmospheric pressure uh, gas in our GI system too, we can have a lot of significant uh, uh, disruption, tearing, trauma to the viscera as well, and of course secondary rupture and hemorrhage. Uh, it People that are in a water where it's a significant explosion, like, you know, and during the war, uh, it may uh, ca cause more of a total body compression syndrome rather than pulmonary and uh, GI gas disturbances. And speaking of the classical decompression illness, or uh, what we uh, generally call the bends, but it has other names depending on what it involves. 
uh, is related to gas solubility, the fact that certain gases like nitrogen and to a lesser but still s measurable extent xenon uh, are not as soluble as oxygen and therefore uh, when a scuba diver shows a rapid increase in um, from a deeper to a surface level these uh, nitrogen bubbles and smaller extent xenon can involve and cause uh, emboli and they can cause uh, emboli just about anywhere uh, basically uh, in the so-called bends where there's significant pains in the extremities, most of these are periarticular. Another uh, scuba expression is called the chokes, in which we see uh, pulmonary uh, air emboli as well. And uh, another term is the staggers for uh, inner ear. Um, these emboli are also going to bones as well, and so uh, often a aseptic or avascular type of necrosis is seen with uh, in the uh, bones as well and uh, this is not an acute effect but more chronic usually a couple days later uh, that's it for now folks uh, let's try and go into the next clip